That is brilliant. I cannot believe how good that is. I can't believe how good that is. Wow. Intimate is on top of their freaking game right now. That is unfreaking believable. I'm Gary, and this is Coasting with Culture, which is all about combining theme park visits and riding roller coasters with various cultural experiences around the world. Last time, the Bose Bar's crew took an early morning ferry to make their way to Sweden, enjoying stops at Liseberg, Kolmarden, and Gronelund, along with a bit of exploring the Swedish capital. This time, the last few folks who went the full length of the journey hit one last country in Finland, flying to Helsinki and stopping by Linnanmaki, then heading north to enjoy Powerland and Sarkin Yemi before the long journey home begins. After a bit of morning chaos trying to gain access to the garage the van was parked, we finally found a way in and drove it to the rental car return so we could catch our flight across to Helsinki. It was neat to see the 747 that was converted into a hotel, as I didn't realize it was here near Stockholm's airport. That would certainly be a stay to add to the bucket list. One of the really neat features of this Finnair Airbus 319 was the inclusion of a camera at the front of the plane so you could see from the pilot's perspective as you approached the airport. Something I hadn't seen since my flight with Scandinavian Airlines back in 2014 on their Airbus A340. After arriving, we decided to take the train to the city center, which meant taking an escalator into the deepest part of hell, Sinki Airport. Riding on the P-Line train to Ortico Rila, we rode until the stop at Pasila, where you could see our destination for the day in the distance. And after a walker scooter ride over, we made it to Lenenmaki. I took a pass on Uko, the park's Maurer Skyloop, since I had ridden it already and had a rather unpleasant experience with the last one I rode at Magic Springs in Arkansas, but I was interested to see how the guys took it. That was fantastic. We literally are in hell right now. Holy yeah, this is something. From there, we went on to the one coaster in the park I had yet to ride. And what was perhaps the biggest surprise of the trip? Taiga, their new Intamin Blitz coaster that features two launches and some incredible elements that give you phenomenal airtime and hang time moments. Right from the get-go, you're hit with a sort of reverse dive loop called a zero-g winder, then twist your way into the booster launch with what might be one of the best sequence of elements to follow. Going into a top hat with great airtime, an inverted stall with awesome hang time, a short bunny hill with a hellacious pop of air, and then a dive loop that brings you into a great twisting section that involves a triple deke that is just plain stupid fun. So how do the guys feel about the ride? That is brilliant. I cannot believe how good that is. I can't believe how good that is. Wow. Intamin is on top of their freaking game right now. That is unfreaking believable. Yeah. Are you guys ready for another round of Taiga? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Needless to say, this was an unexpected hit, and it was awesome that we happened to be at the park on a quieter day because we get to ride a lot more times. We proceeded to make a loop around for the park's other coasters, including their Intamin Zack Spin. Kirnu, which even as a smaller version of the model, still feels a bit more extreme than an SNS 4D free spin. <laughs> we then continue to Vuorisht Orada, 
their classic wooden coaster, which is among the rare variety, to have a brake man on the train who is responsible for ensuring it keeps a safe speed. The ride is pretty fun, although I have to say, I think several in the group became a bit more infatuated with the brake man than the coaster. But that's a story for another time. There were four other coasters in the park, which largely became one and dones for the group, including their Mauer spinning mouse coaster Salma, the Mach E motion coaster Tulireki, a Mach powered coaster Pika Juna, and an indoor customs year force coaster called Linunrata Extra. This isn't to say that any of them were bad coasters, but more that everyone in the group had become head over heels for Taiga, as it really blew us away with how great it was. So right now I don't know for sure where I'm placing this thing. However, I think it's pretty safe to say it's gonna be in the top five. This ride was phenomenal. So the rest of the day was pretty much dedicated to lapping this awesome creation. When the park did close for the day, we hopped back on the train to make our return to the airport area and then head to the hotel for the night. As the sun came up for the start of the final stretch, a group that had reached over 20 people in Poland was now down to the final four as Mark, Ricky, Larson, and I took a drive north from Helsinki for a park that was among the furthest north in the world, Powerland. Like all my other previously visited parks on this trip, this one had a new coaster to ride. Actually, it had two, but some might see them and think it's just one massive new coaster because both Junker and Pit Special are Gerslauer Infinity coasters that have the same color scheme for their track and supports with the same style of trains that are made to resemble airplanes. They are, however, two very different coasters. Junker is a launched coaster with some great inversions and elements that have some of the hang time moments the model is quite well known for. Whereas Pit Special is of the vertical lift variety, starting with a sort of non-inverting figure eight hill after the first drop, which then leads to a series of banked curve drops and a couple bunny hills to the final brake run for some pops of air. One thing that became pretty apparent was that the park was very busy, so we had some concerns about getting to all the coasters due to the longer lines around. But we followed up those two coasters with the Fabry Spinning Mouse, Neo's Twister, that didn't offer much spinning, which seems to be a trend with this model of coaster. We then moved on to their boomerang coaster, Cobra, which is the first to feature a more open style of train from Vacoma that still has the thicker shoulder harnesses. Definitely not the smoothest coaster in the world, but it wasn't too bad. I will say though, I enjoy these a lot more when they have the new version train with the vest restraints like on Carolina Cobra and Carowinds or Boomerang at Fantasylandia. We also rode on Thunderbird, a great coaster's international wood creation with a layout that was mirrored by American Thunder at Six Flags St. Louis. It's still tracking really well compared to some of the wooden coasters out there nowadays. It's not exactly the most thrilling experience, but as far as like upkeep and things like that, they seem to have done a pretty good job here at Powerland. Yeah, I actually thought it tracked better than the one at St. Louis. So yeah, good they... ride was not worth an hour over an hour wait, but yeah. now we're on to bigger and not better things. He certainly wasn't wrong about the not better part, as the next coaster we rode was Joyride, a fairly basic LNT systems coaster that doesn't really offer much more than being a coaster since it's a tamer ride, although for the type it at least has a decent capacity, so this wasn't too bad of a wait. The guys were able to complete the park's coaster collection with a Zamperla family gravity coaster called Mine Train, which I had ridden on that previous visit. So I watched in amusement as they gained their last credit of the park. We had time for a second ride on Junker, which I think we'd all agree was the park's top ride. So I think the guys here will agree, it was busy. 
Yeah, very busy. Definitely, definitely. Very busy. Yes, managed to get all the credits, managed to do an extra ride on Junker, so it was good stuff. Since it was a long drive up to Powerland from Helsinki, we decided to split the drive to Tampier by staying in a small town hotel, which worked well for us, although Larson had some thoughts about it. To be fair though, it did have a slight shining feel to it. The final park day of the trip saw us arriving to Tampier for a visit to Sarkin Yemi, and we went right to their intimate suspended looping coaster, Tornado. This ride isn't the most extreme coaster out there, but has a really intriguing placement, as they created a man-made cave for the station, and it flies right through with a heartline roll, building up anticipation for the waiting riders. It's also a rare model, as there were only two of these ever built, with the other one located in Spain. It gave a nice bit of nostalgia though, since it had some elements that resembled those found on Volcano from King's Dominion. Going from that ride, we found that several of the coasters didn't actually open until noon, including what would be my final new credit of the trip. It was a minor bummer, as we could have slept in a bit, or taken some time to wander around Tampier, but we did get to enjoy a lap on a shameless coaster in Vatimato, another small Tivoli coaster from Zier, like the one we rode at Gronaloon earlier in the trip. We also tried out some flat rides and got some more laps on Tornado as we waited for that noon hour. When the time came, we went right back to Hype, the premier ride Skyrocket 2, although it wouldn't be the most pleasant experience as a heavier rain began to fall right before we got on, but at least they were still running it so the four of us could get the credit. I've always enjoyed these rides, especially the ones that lack the comfort collars that appear on a few of Premier's newer coasters. Not only are we about to ride an awful coaster, we're going to do it in the rain. Yay! And sure enough, it was still a rough ride. But at least the last one the guys needed was more enjoyable with Moto G, the Zamperla Moto Coaster, which offers a fun punchy launch that runs into a fun zigzagging layout. It's a little moist out here. We're gonna go ahead and head back to Helsinki, get to the hotel before the journey home tomorrow, and then kind of see maybe if we get into something tonight, might go back to Linenmaki. And wouldn't you know it, we did go back to Linenmaki as we couldn't resist the chance to go for some additional rides on the awesome Taiga. We also enjoyed another lap on Burish Dorada, Unfortunately, THE brake man was not on duty for us to admire, but the one who was proved more than capable of running this classic ride. As they ascend to the heavens above, this is where we say farewell to our friends. Fare thee well, friends. Fare thee well. One of the crazy things that we're seeing right now since we're back here in the evening before we fly home tomorrow is that this is nine o'clock at night here in Finland and as you can see it's not very dark. And that glow made for some awesome final rides of the night on Taiga before closing. And that my friends is how you finish a trip like this but it's gonna be a long journey home in the morning. Sometimes the worst part of any journey is when you have to head back home. 
While Mark had a fairly easy return back to Amsterdam, Ricky Larson and I had a long journey back home to the States. The three of us were heading to different parts of the country, but two of us had at least one leg together. As Larson and I hopped aboard the same flight to Paris, on board a new model of aircraft I hadn't experienced yet since this was my first time on the fairly new Airbus A220. As we landed in Paris, for the second time on this trip, Larson would just leave me behind, not even saying bye. But this time was understandable, given his short layover and the complexity of Charles de Gaulle Airport. Since I had a few hours to spend before the flight to Toronto, I took the chance to visit Air Canada's Paris Lounge, which was a bit different than those I've tried in Canada, as it was in the basement level of the terminal, but it did offer some decent food, including the chance to blend French crepes with Canadian maple syrup. After a few hours in that Paris Lounge, the time came to board the flight to Toronto. Got a bit of a tight connection here in Toronto, so I uh, hope I make my flight to Vancouver. It didn't help when getting in line for customs and seeing how long it was, but as luck would have it, the plane hadn't even arrived to the gate before I did, so it was a delay that worked in my favor to get over to Vancouver. Now the question is, will I catch the bus in Vancouver? We'll find out. Landing in Vancouver, I could have really used a quick taxi to the gate, but that didn't happen. Of course, this is really helping my chance of catching that bus tonight, so uh, fingers crossed we get moving here soon because I've got a little bit more than an hour before the bus takes off. On the bright side, this was a domestic flight, so I could just head right to the SkyTrain to get back to Pacific Central Station. Luckily, there weren't any delays on the SkyTrain, as I made it in time for the bus, although if I knew what was going to happen, I probably could have been a little less rushed. Got here like 15 minutes ahead of the time that the bus was supposed to depart. Uh, the bus just now showed up about 40 minutes after it was supposed to have departed, 
and the driver said they need to take a break, so we're looking at another half hour, I think, is what she said. Eventually, though, we were able to load up and begin the drive back south, meaning I could complete my journey home. While I struggled to stay awake, leading up to Everett Station around 1 in the morning, I was grateful to be back home after a really long travel day. I may not be able to state enough how much it meant to me to return to international travel after the long hiatus from the pandemic. Even though this trip was more coaster and theme park oriented than others shared here on Coasting with Culture, there were some neat experiences to complement some great parks and coasters from this adventure. But there was something that stood out even more about this trip, and that was the company. This excursion would have been completely different without some great friends from the Buzz Bars Coaster Club, and I continue to believe this is one of the best groups you can be a part of in this crazy theme park and roller coaster hobby. A huge thank you to Larson, because even though I was about to rage on him that one time, his sharing a potential itinerary led to one of my favorite trips ever, and I'll gladly join him again in the future to explore more of the world. Although I can't promise I won't try to leave him behind somewhere. Another thank you goes to Mike, Marcus, Sloan, and the rest of the Buzz Bars Executive Committee for their part in creating and leading one of the most fun groups I've had a chance to be a part of, and for carrying out yet another excellent event in Stumblelandia. If you'd like to keep up with future plans of the club, or to get information about joining, click the link on the club's website, and there you'll find such information, or follow them on various social media pages. You can also find a link to the club's YouTube page, where the awesome video compilations made by Allison can give you a better idea of what to expect from an event. Speaking of Allison, a massive thank you to her and everyone on the trip who shared their photos and video of this adventure that were used in this vlog series. It truly helped me to tell the story of this adventure we had together, and I'm grateful for the willingness of Buzz Bar members to share such media as it can often fill the holes that my personal footage may leave behind due to getting caught up in the moment of these trips and events. And with that, we conclude this look back at the great European coaster run with the Buzz Bars Coaster Club. And I hope it won't be nearly as long before the next opportunity to share more international experiences here on Coasting with Culture. Thank you for watching this Coasting with Culture video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button below to see future videos here on YouTube like these ones which you may enjoy as well. Additional content can be found at coastingwithculture.com and you can also follow Coasting with Culture on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for announcements, previews, and updates. Thanks again for watching and until next time, take care and safe travels.